Welcome everyone. Thank you so much for joining us for this informational webinar about the Betty Irene Moore Fellowship for Nurse Leaders and Innovators. My name is Megan Hansen and I'm the Communications and Marketing Specialist for the program. And before I introduce today's speaker, I'd like to go over a few Zoom features that we're going to be using today. So like most webinars, only the host will be speaking and we will be using the chat feature to ask questions. So when you have a question, simply type it in the chat. Our team is monitoring the chat and is going to be consolidating those questions. So we will review and provide answers at the end of the session. Also, we are recording this webinar and we'll send the recording to you in the next day or so. We will also be posting a copy of the recording on our website. And now I want to introduce you to your speaker, Dr. Heather M. Young, who is the National Program Director for the Fellowship. Take it away, Heather. Thank you so much, Megan. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to see you here today, and thank you for making time to be with us. I'm very happy you could join us to learn more about the fellowship program, and I hope we can answer some of your questions. We're very excited about this opportunity, and we're glad that you have shown such interest, and we hope we can pique your interest further during our conversation today. It's a really important opportunity that the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation has funded to advance nurse leadership in our country. They're very interested in advancing the next generation of leaders and innovators, and that's what we're here to talk about. In today's session, I'll be giving you an overview of the program, eligibility for the fellowship, the curriculum, and the application process. As Megan mentioned earlier, please type your questions into the chat and we'll address those at the end of the formal presentation. So I'm going to go through the basics of the program and then we'll entertain the questions. Just to start, I'd like to introduce you to two very, very important people, people who have changed my life and I hope can change yours as well, Gordon and Betty Moore. The generosity of the Moore family and the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation makes this possible. And they have a vision to change the world through nursing. Gordon Moore, many of you may have met, if you've, if you've had a, a computer with Intel inside, you have had an encounter with Gordon Moore in your life. He changed the world with his inventions of the semiconductor and founding Intel and his work in, the, in computer science. And he really changed so much with, with his ideas and his thoughts. His wife, Betty, is also a mover and a shaker who's changing the world. She's a person who, they're both in their 90s, they live in Hawaii now, and she spent a lot of her life caring for family members and encountering the healthcare system in different ways. And through her experiences, she saw how important nurses are to the health of our nation. She also saw the flaws and the problems with our healthcare system. And as she experienced the healthcare system, she always wondered why, you know, how, how, what would happen if nurses could lead, if nurses had the power, the authority, and the skills to be able to lead change in systems. And to use some of the principles that Gordon used in his work, systems engineering and changing the way systems are created and, and, and delivered, um, how, how would that, what would that do for nursing? And so she started a commitment and a, and a long-standing commitment to advancing nursing in our country. And we are so fortunate that she's such a strong advocate and, and champion for nursing. They started with some programs in the, in the Bay Area, the San Francisco Bay Area, with hospital systems where they spent 10 years investing in over 100 hospitals who did quality improvement projects that were nurse-driven and looking at nurse sensitive outcomes and showed some tremendous results with that investment. Their second major investment was the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing and they awarded the largest gift to nursing in the history of nursing at that time in 2007 to UC Davis. And that's where we started the, Gordon and Betty, the, the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing. And it was founded on the idea of leadership and system change and really putting nurses in a position to make those kinds, that kind of a difference. And that school is thriving and doing so well now, this is over a decade later. And the third major initiative is this fellowship. This fellowship is actually expanding the vision and honoring Betty at a national level, where we're actually looking to find the next generation of leaders in nursing and to invest in those leaders to develop the kinds of skills 
and the ability to lead through these very interesting, turbulent, and changing times. And so this program is really intended to find people who can lead. And when we think about leadership, we think about it very broadly. It's not just the traditional leader that we all think about who has a title that's a leader, but it's with the idea that nurses have access to populations and, and have work that is important at so many levels in so many types of organizations, and that building our leadership capacity from wherever we are is vital to improving health and equity in the United States and globally. So at the end of the fellowship, we hope that our fellows have increased leadership capacity, they have an expanded network to be able to engage with others and make change, and confidence to take creative ideas to fruition. So that's the vision for our fellowship. Um, I want to introduce you to some very important people that you'll get to know through this process with the application and beyond, and that's our National Program Office. I'm so honored to be the National Program Director. I had the privilege and honor of being the founding dean of the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing, and so it's a wonderful opportunity to continue with, with Betty Irene Moore's legacy in this new way. I'm joined by Associate Director Elena Siegel, who was a founding faculty member of the Gordon and Be of the Betty Irene Moore School of Nursing as well, and Jenna Katz-Bell, who was also a member of that initial founding, and she's our Associate Director of Operations. Our program office team is so capably led by Monica Escada, who's our program manager, joined by Kristen Venditelli, Dan Carter, and Megan Hansen. And all of our team, the entire program office, is here to help you navigate this process and to work with you as we go forward. I'm also so delighted that we have an illustrious Fellowship National Advisory Council, people who have been with us since the beginning of imagining this fellowship, who have guided us and worked with us closely to develop the fellowship, to develop the curriculum. They're actively involved in screening applicants. They're actively involved in interviewing. And then once people become fellows, they're engaged as faculty, as mentors, and as people who are supportive of the program and of everyone who's participating in the program. So I encourage you to, to take a look at our website and learn more about our National Advisory Council as well. We have a really important partnership with the UC Davis Graduate School of Management. Um, and this is something that we thought was, was absolutely foundational to this fellowship that we want to advance the careers of nurse scientists. And the kinds of skills that we want to develop and to help people flourish are the kinds of skills that typically aren't taught in schools of nursing. And so we were so lucky to be able to partner with the UC Davis Graduate School of Management. And this is a, a highly rated school of business in the nation and has really known for its innovation in partnering with different disciplines to advance leadership in their domains. And so we have a, a fantastic faculty. You can see them on our website as well, drawing from the Graduate School of Management, who actually have worked on designing the curriculum with us and are the faculty who deliver the curriculum, along with other faculty that we've engaged across the country who bring specific expertise. And of course, the Gordon and Betty Moore Foundation, we can't thank them enough for their generous investment in us and in the future of nursing, and they're a steadfast partner and thought leader in this area. I'm going to turn to some details about the fellowship itself. The fellowship is intended for people who are early to mid-career nursing scholars and innovators. We do target people who have PhDs in nursing. We're interested in developing leadership and innovation, and so we have a curriculum that is designed very much with that in mind and it's coupled with robust mentor support. It's a three-year fellowship starting July 1st of every year, and we provide $450,000 in project funding and an additional $50,000 to the home institution for the fellow. And we're admitting about 10 fellows per year to this program. You're in the process of hearing about our third round of applications. So we have two cohorts already in, and I'll introduce you to those fellows in a moment. I'd like to talk a little bit about the program components and our goals for the program. There are four main areas that we really want to develop and to enable fellows to, to move along in their trajectory. The first is understanding yourself as a leader. 
Because once you understand yourself and you understand your, your goals, your aspirations, and your passions, and you have a sense of your strengths and your areas for improvement, you can develop a path for yourself in the direction that you need to take to be able to develop and to thrive as a leader. The second element of the program is around skills to influence system change. These are the kinds of practical and, and, and strategic ideas and skills that you need to have to be able to make the changes that you need to, to make in, in the world and systems to enact your passion. The third is building your confidence to, to be able to take ideas to fruition. Being a leader can be a lonely job, and it's sometimes you're up against a lot of challenges, and being able to have that confidence and the support to be able to move ideas forward is really an important element. And then finally, expanding your network and expanding it beyond the usual suspects so that we all have people we know that we've known for a long time. But with this fellowship program, we really try to help you to expand that network to think about other areas and stakeholders that may be important to advance your vision for health and health equity. I'm going to talk a little bit in more detail about the curriculum and the activities. Before I do that, though, I just want to mention that we enact our program components in different ways. There are a lot of things that we do that have to do with group activities. And some of our group activities include an annual convocation that happens every year in July, and it's a mandatory part of the program. We have online courses that are asynchronous that you may take through the year. We have monthly meetings of the fellowship cohort, and these are two-hour meetings where we come together and we deepen our understanding of what happened in the, in the group, uh, in the convocation and with the curriculum, and continue to work and support each other. And then we have workshops. There are also individual activities. We ask that you develop an individual development plan that will be part of your, your roadmap, in essence, for your leadership journey. You'll have a research project, which is a large part of your effort and your, and your engagement. And then you're going to have two mentors and, and a network. So those are the different components of the program. In the curriculum itself, we focus on a, a variety of different topics that will actually develop skills and knowledge in leadership and innovation. And this is delivered primarily in July. And we use the Canvas format so that the learning activities and the resources that we provide are available to you throughout your time in the fellowship. And you're able to access those at any time and apply them. We ask you when you apply to select a mentor that you come to the program with. And this mentor will be someone that will be able to help you guide, will guide you with your project and with your leadership. And you'll have a chance to think about who might be the best person for that role. And then we also appoint a mentor from the National Program Office, someone who might expand your network and your perspective. And then we'll, we'll be very pleased to say there will be alumni very soon, and we plan to have a robust program to engage our alumni and to keep you all together as you go forward with your careers after the fellowship. I'm going to turn for a moment to eligibility so you can think about whether you are eligible to apply for this fellowship. I'm going to talk first about institutional eligibility. There are two main sources of, of eligible fellows. One are those who are in academic programs, and the others are those who are in different kinds of organizations. And we welcome both, and we encourage applications from all of these different places. For academic institutions, we have a list that every year is reviewed and approved by a Fellowship National Advisory Council, and it's on the website. So go to our website and look at eligible institutions, if you're at an academic institution, to see if you're on that list. And if you are, you would be eligible to apply this year. If your institution is not on the list, you can let us know about your interest. And every year as we evaluate the eligible institutions, we take into consideration um, those are institutions that are not on our list currently. Then the second major group are those who are nurse scientists who are working in a major health system or organization that has a demonstrated commitment to nursing science, innovation, and leadership. These might be health systems, hospital-based or community-based systems. Nurses who are working in public health are also welcome, people who might be in governmental agencies or non-governmental organizations. 
the the main issue with the the, the situ- settings that are not academic is that there's a demonstrated commitment to nursing science and nursing leadership, because scholarship is a vital component of the work. And if you have questions about any of these organizations, you can always get in touch with us. We're happy to talk it through with you and determine eligibility. And then there's the applicant eligibility. This is about you and who you are. We're looking for people who have PhDs that were conferred between 2012 and 2017. And this is because we'd like to have a cohort of people with roughly the same level of experience post-PhD and who can be in, who are in the same general area of their career trajectory. Now, some people may be eligible because they have a PhD conferred a little bit earlier, but had a, a, an approved leave of absence. And those are situations that we look at individually, and I'm happy to confer with you if you fall into one of those situations. We expect that our applicants have at least one degree in nursing or nursing science. So you might have an RN uh, license and an undergraduate degree in nursing and a PhD in another field. Or you might be a person who isn't an RN, but you have a PhD in nursing science. Both would be eligible. We expect that applicants commit at least 30% of effort starting on July 1 and throughout the fellowship program. So if you are in a situation when you can't commit that level of effort, you would not be eligible. And we actually ask for attestation by the dean or the, the chief nursing officer that you will be available and, and able to commit 30% of your time. We also ask that you commit in advance to attend the annual convocation in July because this is such a vital component of our programming. And then we also ask that you commit to the monthly online meetings and that you also engage with your mentors and with the learning activities that are part of the fellowship. So with that said, that, gets, that, that establishes our eligibility. Let me talk a little bit about the project itself. The project is intended to ad- address an important question or develop and test an innovative idea. One of, the, one of the most exciting things about this fellowship, I think, is that it's not traditional. It's, it's, there's a very wide umbrella for the kinds of projects that would fit within this fellowship. And it's an opportunity for people who are exploring ideas that may not yet have the preliminary data or information to be able to go for NIH funding. And it's an opportunity to go deeper in those kinds of ideas. It's also an opportunity for people who are thinking about innovations that may or may not be traditional research. It might be an invention. It might be a, a, an actual implementation of, of evidence in, and it's incorporating implementation science. So there are a variety of different possibilities of what this could look like. The idea, though, is that it has to generate new knowledge. No matter what the, the type of project, the scholarship aspect of it is important. So whatever you think about proposing, consider about how you're advancing knowledge for our field and advancing the, the changes in the system that we're hoping for. So the project itself is a project that lasts about, think of it as about a two-year period for a project. It's the size of a small R01 or an R21 in terms of the size and scope of a grant. It's a project that we hope that you can put some ideas to. And when you see the application, you'll notice that it's not a traditional application with your typical specific aims, methods, and, and the type of format that you would use for an NIH proposal. We're asking you to talk about your idea and the, the approaches that you're thinking you might take to it. Um, in the first six months of the fellowship, you'll have the opportunity to work with your mentors and with the program office to refine that proposal. And at the end of that first six months of your program, you will finalize your proposal for the project itself. So the idea is you start the fellowship on July 1st, and by January 1st of the following year, you would begin your project. And this is really a, an intentional design on the part of our fellowship. We want you to be able to engage with the curriculum, with the innovation aspects of the curriculum, to think about whether there might be different ways of approaching your problem, your research. So you have that latitude. Some people come in with their idea already well developed and are able to make very small refinements and start in January. Others have really changed their projects quite substantially. So the idea for the application is, let us understand the problem you're trying to solve and the approach you're thinking of coming, coming up with. 
and then you'll have time to refine that in that process. Think about it as a two-year project period. So you start in January of the, sec of the first year of your fellowship and that you would end it by the December two years later so that you'd still have time in the fellowship the last six months to wrap up the project, to do some dissemination, and start to pursue funding for the next phase of the work. So that helps you to kind of scope and think about the project. I'm going to talk a little bit about the budget. It's a budget that in total is $500,000, and the institution gets $50,000. And this is a project that comes with no indirect, and the $50,000 is in lieu of indirect funds. Now, because you come from many different types of organizations, and different organizations have very different needs, we leave that $50,000 of, of funds to the institution up to the discretion of the dean or the chief nursing officer of your organization. And there's, on our website, you can see allowable uses of that $50,000. But it's really intended to be money to the organization that helps to support you and to help to, and help to support nursing scholarship. We have, and, and, and as part of the application process, we ask that the dean or the CNO address how they would use those funds. And we've seen a great variety in, of creative approaches. Some people use the money to backfill your position as the fellow is active and is not able to teach or, or conduct other types of activities. Others have used it for professional development funds for the general group of faculty in the school. Others have uh, turned that money back to the fellow and said, please use it to enhance your budget and to enhance your staffing for your project. So there are a variety of different ways that this can be used, and we can talk that over if you have questions. The budget must include 30% of your time. We're hoping that every fellow devotes and is, is, is dedicated to the project and to the fellowship activities, because the activities take about 60 hours a year, and you want to make sure that you're devoting enough time for that. So include that in your budget. And then there are a variety of different expenditures that are allowed, and our website elaborates on this, and I really encourage you to, to use the website as a resource as you look at this. But usual kinds of expenses that we would like to see in your budget are your project personnel. You might choose to have your mentor as a co-investigator and, and put them on the project. You don't have to, but that's possible. You might have other faculty, certainly staff for your project, um, equipment and supplies that you might need for the work, licenses and software, consultants, um, particularly if you're doing an invention or something that's related to a business application. Um, some of our fellows have included business consultants or legal consultants in their, in their budget. And then you might have expenses that relate to data collection, including paying participants and analysis. And then you can also put in there professional development expenses, um, travel costs, registration fees for conferences. And when you'll be developing your individual development plan, your IDP, you're going to talk about the kinds of professional activities that are important to you that you want to engage with in the fellowship, and you can put those in your budget. So, for example, some fellows have decided to take a course at a different institution, and they've included the tuition in their budget. You don't need to use um, your funds and your 450000 for travel to convocation. That's a cost that we will cover as part of the National Program Office. So the travel in, the, in your budget would be for conferences and, and different types of activities that are related to your own personal development. I'm going to talk a little bit about elements of successful applications. Keeping in mind that we're interested in the next generation of nurse leaders and innovators, we want to know and see your potential as you write to us and as you write about yourself and about your, your, your dreams and your aspirations. We really want to see, um, a, we want to get a sense of who you are now, what your aspirations are for the future, and how do, you think those, how do you think your journey is going to go? In other words, what's the big vision that you have for changing the world, for improving health, improving health equity, or addressing a, a health care issue? What is it that's important to you? And how do you think with your project and with your leadership you're going to make that difference? Our Fellowship National Advisory Council, as they review the applications, really looks for that element of it. 
So saying that I want to be an associate dean for research is not an aspiration about your trajectory. It's certainly a job aspiration and a career aspiration, but it doesn't capture how you want to see the world different with your actions. So we really encourage you to be as, as thoughtful as you can be about how you think you will have make a difference and how the, the leadership and the innovation training will help you to enact your big picture, your big picture vision for an improved situation in the world. We really encourage you to ask trusted peers and mentors and other people to help you to think about this and to expand your thinking. We also really want to understand that your pro problem that you're trying to solve is an important, compelling problem, and that it's something that we really need to put our attention to and invest in for change for the future. So talk about your prog problem in a way that helps us to understand why it's so important and how your project is going to be a step in the way of addressing that issue. We also want to make sure that your mentor and your home institution are very supportive. So we look for strong letters of support from your mentor and from your dean or chief nursing officer so that we really understand that you will be supported the mentor in the, in the fellowship program and you'll be able to enact your, your dreams while you're in the program. I'm going to share a few tips that we've gleaned from the different uh, experiences that we've had so far. The first is to definitely request feedback about your proposal from other people. Talk to trusted peers, to mentors, people in your social network to get some feedback from them because this can really help you to articulate your aspirations and your innovation because this is an area that I think is, is very valuable for you to understand for yourself regardless of what happens with the fellowship. And it's absolutely vital that you are able to communicate this well to us in your written application and then in subsequent rounds of the process. Practice communicating your big picture vision. Practice communicating it with people verbally and in writing. So getting that feedback and practicing it, hearing it yourself is going to help you to hone that message. Think globally about how the fellowship will advance your leadership and innovation. So certainly the, the skills and the specific skills are going to be important, but think about it in terms of your total trajectory of your leadership and, and as you're going to be developing yourself as a leader. Share your drafts and, your schedule, and schedule your time so that you can actually discuss your application with your mentor and with your dean or chief nursing officer so that you can actually get that feedback, feedback and input. So we encourage you to reach out. It might be people who've been mentors in the past who know you or partners in practice. Ask them to review your application and, 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 ask, and ask them about your strengths and successes. Sometimes it's hard to be, not to be humble and to be able to put ourselves in a light that, that um, really displays our strength. So encourage people to help give you that feedback so that you can talk about your strengths. And then ask for diverse stakeholders to look at it, um, not just the people who are your usual mentors that look at it. Ask people who might be um, others who would be able to be knowledgeable about your project or about you because the people who will be reviewing your application are diverse stakeholders. So that will help you to, to be able to resonate with more. So there are a few questions that people have asked about budgets that I want to just uh, cover now. And they might already be in the chat. And if they are, we will we'll avoid them later. But I just want to talk about these are the very common questions that seem to come up. Some of the questions are, should the institutional $50,000 be included? And absolutely, put that in there. And the dean or the CNO will be the, will be the person who would attest to how that money will be spent in their letters. You can compensate self-selected mentors. They might come in as a co-investigator or as a mentor or a consultant, and you can certainly um, put them in your budget. You are allowed to have co-investigators on your budget. There is no indirect cost return, and that $50,000 to your institution is in lieu of indirect costs. You absolutely can include professional membership dues. That would be an appropriate investment of, of funding to advance your leadership journey. Please don't include the travel costs to convocation. We'll pay for that, and, and we'll talk about that later. It is possible to allocate more than 30% of your time if your project warrants that. 
So as you put together your budget justification, you can talk about that if you need to spend more time on it, and that would be fine. And then the really important question, is the budget final? The budget is not final. You can work with and think about $150,000 per year as the, as the ballpark amount. It might be that you spend less in the first year and a whole lot more in the second year. The total is $450,000, and we expect you to spend that in the course of the three years. Um, we, we, we prefer not to have any carry forward, so it's, we expect that you will spend the funding. But you will have a chance to refine your budget. As I mentioned earlier, you'll be working in the first six months to refine your project. And when you refine the project, it really might affect your budget. So we'll give you the opportunity to reflect on your budget and to see whether the budget as you initially proposed it still reflects your project. For example, you might change your aims and you might change the way you're going to be doing your study, and in which case you might have different types of resource needs. So you'll have a chance to reaffirm that and then the final budget and final project proposal are reviewed and are due the December 1st so that you'll be ready to roll January of the, of the next year. I'm going to talk about some logistics for a moment before we get into questions. Um, we have the Qualtrics application process. There's two parts. There's the Qualtrics where you're going to answer the questions that we ask of you. And then there's a PDF that we ask you to submit that has required materials that we would like you to put together in a PDF in a specific order. And this is on our website. You can take a look at that. But the Qualtrics application does allow you to save as you go. You can request your own link, and you, as you can see on the website where to request your link. We issue a link to you, and then it will save as you, as you start working on the application. You can come back to it later. However, we really strongly recommend that you take the sample application from the website that's in a Word document and use that to fill it out and to complete your application and then upload it into the Qualtrics in one sitting. That seems to go more smoothly for people and it's an easier way to go. So we encourage you to do that. And then you'll see the list of the required materials that includes your CV and the letters and your mentor's uh, bio sketch. And so you can look at that, and that will be compiled in a, in a single PDF. We don't take additional materials. We just want you to give us what we're asking for so we can keep it even for everybody. I'm going to talk a little bit about our timeline now. Today, uh, the 24th, welcome to this important day, because this is the day our applications actually open. And they're due by December 1st, 5 p.m. Pacific time. We will then be doing our reviews internally, and we work with uh, the Fellowship National Advisory Council to do a robust review of all of our applications. And in the week of February 7th, we meet with the Fellowship National Advisory Council to identify applicants that we would like to bring in for interviews. Then February 22nd to 24th are three days that we dedicate to interviewing our finalists. And so if you are applying, please mark those days as potential. You wouldn't have to attend more than an, a couple of hours in those days. There's Zoom interviews, uh, and there is some ability for us to flex around schedule. But please keep some time open on those days um, in case you're asked to come for an interview. So we conduct those interviews the 22nd to the 24th of February. And then we confer again with the National Advisory Council um, with, the, with all of the, the summaries of the interviews and of all the application uh, processing. And in the week of March 1st, we will notify our lead candidates that they are being offered positions in the fellowship. We give them an opportunity to think about it and accept. And once we have acceptance from our cohort, then we will announce the cohort in April. And the cohort um, will join us, and the program begins July 1st of 2022. And we can, you can expect that, and we're finalizing the actual dates, but the convocation will be in the last two weeks of July, about a week of that time, and very soon we will post the actual dates. So at this point, please hold that time available um, in case you, you're one of the fellows who will be coming to Sacramento. I just want to briefly introduce you to our fellows uh, that are in the program now for a couple of reasons. One is you might know someone, and if you do, please don't hesitate to reach out to them. 
The other reason is if you go to our website and you can meet our fellows, there are short videos that each of our fellows has prepared um, that talk about their vision and their project and the fellowship program. And you can also see a short summary of their projects. This may give you a very good idea about the kinds of things that people are doing. I don't want you to be limited by what's on the list for these 21 talented people because we're expecting to see different ideas from you. Um, but this will just give you a sense of the type of, of project. This is our cohort, our inaugural cohort, who are in their second year of the pro program right now. And you'll see that they represent a variety of different populations um, across the lifespan, that there's some who are in acute care settings, some are in the community, a real array of different types of experiences and interests. The second cohort just came in in July. We were so happy to welcome our second cohort. And that cohort has, is also incredibly diverse and interesting with their interests. Um, they also range with, with a lot of different populations and areas of expertise. Across the two cohorts, there are some who are very much in community-based health promotion, public health types of ideas. There are some who are very technology-focused. There are some who are in health systems and are looking at system change and clinical change. Um, so there's a, a really interesting array of people, and I encourage you to just look and see it will give you a feel for some of the kinds of projects and the people who are engaged in our, in our fellowship already. We're so proud of them and so excited that they're part of, part of this fellowship. So at this point, I'd really appreciate it if you uh, um, would think about your questions and put them in the chat. I can see we already have some already. And we're going to move into our Q&A session at this point. Monica Escada, our program manager for the fellowship, and Kristen Venditali, our project manager, will introduce the questions that you asked. So uh, let's take it away to that. Hi, everyone. Um, sorry, I was trying to start my video, but I wasn't able to do that, so apologies. But uh, this is Monica, and my first question, Heather, that we had in the chat is, does the project itself need to advance new knowledge, or can it be pilot data used to design a future study that will advance new knowledge? I think, you know, this isn't a pilot, it's a large grant, it's not a pilot grant. So if you think about it with your aims, you might have a pilot aim and then you might have a larger aim that advances the work. So the idea is that you will be on a trajectory to advancing knowledge, hopefully that you would have some publications that come out of your work. So even when you're doing a pilot study, there might be lessons learned that are methodological or where you have data that is publishable. So think about it in, from that perspective. And think about um, aims that build on one another. And you might start small and, and do some initial feasibility work and then do a little bit further along in the process with testing and innovation or an idea. Very good question. Heather, this is Kristen. And I'm going to, uh, I have a series of questions about mentors. Uh, so the first one okay. I'll ask is, does the self-selected mentor have to be from the same organization as the fellow? And this person in particular is saying, I have, a, have developed a relationship with a mentor in a different institution because I do not have anyone at my institution with a similar area of research. Great question. Absolutely. The idea between a self -select, of a, a self-selected mentor is that it's someone who, who knows you and, and knows your work, can advance your project, but also your leadership and innovation. You know, there's several elements to this project. So you've got, you've got the project, but you also have the leadership journey. And as you think about your mentor, think about the different parts of what they can offer to you. Um, and so picking your mentor as, as someone who's going to be hand in hand with you through the process and giving you advice and support. That doesn't mean you don't have other mentors. For example, if you're in, a, in an institution where there's a strong research office, you might have very good mentorship around grantsmanship in the, in the research office. And so your mentor is more of a content expert who really helps you with your particular research question. Um, it might be that you have, you're still in touch with a postdoc mentor or someone you've had in your past that's still providing support to you, but you identify a new mentor for a particular aspect. One of the things that both you and the mentor will discuss in your application is how this mentor is going to help you with your project and with your leadership journey. 
So that's the important part is to discuss how this, how this partnership that you'll develop with this person um, will advance that work. It can be someone you've worked with before, but if it is, I really encourage you to think about how is it different with the fellowship. You know, when you're an undergrad or when you're a PhD student and you have a mentor, you have a very different set of circumstances and requirements as, on both sides. And as you evolve in a relationship and you become a, a mentor-mentee later in your career, you might need to renegotiate what they're helping you with and, and think about that. So that's part of what we'd like you to reflect on in your application. Thank you so much, Heather. I am going to just confirm that in your response, you responded to two other questions. One came from someone asking, can or should the self-selected mentor be someone who is already considered a mentor or should a new leadership mentor be sought? You, you definitely responded to that. And then also, does the mentor have to be someone from nursing? Can the mentor be from a different discipline or and done similar work as our topic of interest? I believe very you touched good on question. that. We're very open to mentors from, from wherever they may come. Um, and the idea is that they have to be able to help you advance your work. And so we very much encourage mentors from other fields uh, with expertise. And it, it really helps to develop team science and develop your abilities to work across disciplines. So that's, that's completely acceptable. And we'd be delighted to, have, to entertain those. On the website, you can also see when you look at the fellows, their mentors are listed. So you can get a feel for that. There are quite a few of our fellows in the program already who have uh, mentors from other fields and other institutions as well. Thank you. And this last question about uh, mentors is, can we have more than one mentor from the institution? Yes, you can have more than one mentor. I, what we'd like you to do is identify your primary mentor and that role, which is really the vital role. And, and in terms of our communication, we communicate with your primary mentor very closely. That doesn't preclude you from having a mentoring team and to include other people in that as well. You might include them in your budget, depending on the kind of role that they're playing with you. Um, but having a primary mentor is important, and uh, that's the person you'd be talking about primarily in your application. Um, you can, of course, also mention that you have a, another mentor as well. But um, you, we, we really welcome that. If you do have more than one mentor, you need to think a little bit about mentor management and how you, how you work with two different mentors or more, and who's, who's responsible for what. And when you have more than one mentor, are there different aspects of your growth and development that they're supporting you with so that you can describe that in the process? Wonderful. Thank you, Heather. This is Monica again, and I have some uh, budget questions for you. And so- the, Okay. The this one, again, is something that you answered. I just want to make sure that we reiterate. So the question is, is the budget developed as part of the fellowship, or does this need to be developed as part of the application? And you had answered that um, there is a budget that's submitted as part of the application, but that they continue to work on and it evolves um, during those first six months. And so wanted to make sure that we emphasize that. Um, and then the second uh, budget question that, that overlaps a little bit with mentorship is, what is the standard FTE for the mentor? Is it required to fund the mentor? Can research assistance be funded? Thank you. Great question. There is no standard for the uh, mentor, and some mentors are not funded on the fellowship at all, and others are funded. Um, if the mentor is also a co-investigator and plays a role in the project, that might increase the percentage that you, that you uh, allot to your mentor. Um, it, you'll be doing a budget justification along with your budget. So you can say, I'm putting my mentor in at 5% because I'm going to be meeting every other week and we're going to be discussing these issues and this is the investment that we're going to make in my mentor. Um, or it could be that my mentor and I is meeting with me on my mentorship aspects of the fellowship, but that that, that person is also a co-investigator and so has a particular role on the project, in which case, that would be part of the justification as well. Thank you, Heather. I'm gonna turn it over to Kristen. Thank you, Monica. I am now going to run through uh, some eligibility questions. Uh, the first one is, are past K awardees eligible? 
Yes, past K awardees are eligible, but you do need to show that this fellowship is going to do something in, in addition and enhancing your trajectory. If you've already had substantial investment in another fellowship program or a K award, the question that the reviewers will ask is, why do you need another one? What is it about this fellowship that is going to enhance your trajectory? So be ready to address that if you've already had substantial support. Thank you. Next one is, what about people with dual appointments? 75% academia and 25% VA, are they eligible? The eligibility isn't related to that as much as can you devote 30% of your time to the project? And if you're in a dual appointment, I would recommend you get a letter from both of your, both of the, your supervisors, your dean and your, and your uh, CNO at the VA or whoever is the, uh, the lead person for your unit that would say that together, even though you're in this dual appointment, you are able to allocate 30% of your time to the fellowship. Because that's, that's the thing that we're most concerned about, and we want to make sure that for those that we award the, the grant, they are able to participate fully. Next one. Thank you, Heather, so much. Uh, next one is, does the program accept nurse scientists working in related academic disciplines? For example, a nurse in a public health school. Absolutely. That is exciting to think about that. We're really looking for nurse scientists wherever you are and leading from wherever you are. And as you know, with the Future of Nursing report that's just come out, it's so vital that we um, expand our thinking around public health and social determinants of health, health equity. And so bringing people in from different perspectives is really very valued. Uh, so the, the idea is that you have to be eligible. Um, but then as far as the the organization, you would be applying then, not as an academic school of nursing, but you'd be in the eligible institutions under an institutional um, a health system type of an institution. And you'd need to talk about that and about how that organization supports your scholarship. Two more questions about uh, eligibility. Uh, if not accepted upon first application, can one apply again the following year? Absolutely. Um, as long as you're eligible, the, the period for eligibility this year is getting a PhD 2012 to 2017. Next year, it'll be 2013 to 2018. So the eligibility period shifts a little bit. So that if you're, if you're a 2012 graduate, you would not be eligible next year. But if you are uh, between 2013 and 2017, you would be eligible next year. It's a very competitive process. And every year we've had a much larger pool than people who are selected. And we, are, we wish we could award more fellowships. And so we're really eager to see people come back in the pool and look forward to that and, in the, and, and to be able to look at the applications. And it's a chance to refine and improve your application if you have that opportunity to come back. Thank you. And one last one about eligibility. Can the fellow have an R01 during the program? For example, what happens if the fellow receives an R01 in year two or three of the program? Yes, absolutely. That would be seen as a success for you that you're advancing your career in that way. Again, the important issue for us is that you can devote 30% of your time to our project and to the fellowship. So if you have additional funding, um, then that you would need to talk to us about how this all fits in your life and your priorities so that you're able to do both. Uh, but fellows are uh, often very engaged in many aspects of their careers, in teaching and research in other kinds of service, sometimes in practice. And so it's a juggling act to figure out how to manage this over a three-year period. And all of you are on a trajectory where you're, you're seeking funding, you're working on opportunities. So it's going to be an opportunity to keep juggling all of that with the caveat that we need to make sure that the 30% is what you're able to dedicate to the fellowship. As these great um, opportunities come up and the good news comes in with, with other funding, we can talk about how that juggling happens, but we certainly expect your engagement at 30%. All right, thank you, Heather. Um, so I have, a couple, I have two questions about sort of institutional dynamics as they relate to the relationships and the budget. So the first one is, is there a proper way to find out if someone else is applying for the fellowship from my institution? 
Great question. The best way to ask is go to the top. Um, you send a note to your dean and your associate dean of research, or if you're in a, in a health system setting, write to the, the lead person there and ask them if they're aware of anyone else who's applying and let them know your intention. We sent out letters to all the deans this week of the eligible institutions that we are open for business, that applications are open. So they, they've had a, a notification that they are, uh, they are eligible. So they shouldn't be surprised when you get in touch with them. And if they are, you can ask them to just check and see. They can come to our website or they can look in their inbox because we sent out a, a message to them this week. But we really do encourage you to tell them soon because we're asking them to make a decision about the one candidate that they want to put forward from their institution. So you don't want to go too far down the line and find out someone else is working on it as well. So communicate early um, and communicate with those who would be writing the letter of support. Great. And the second question is, is the 30% effort for fellows expected to be cost shared with the institution or does the full 30% effort need to come out of the 450,000? The 450,000 um, is we expect you to put 30% of your time into the 450,000. Now, if your institution decides that they want to support you and take over that funding, that's certainly something we can talk about, but we want to make sure that you have that dedicated time. And in, in some cases, when the institution is saying, no, we'll support that 30%, that funding then would be available and maybe you have a postdoc or a research staff member or a research assistant that um, it, it helps you to, to execute the project. Thank okay. you. Oh, sorry, Monica, thank you. Uh, there are still some eligibility questions um, and mentorship questions coming up. So uh, one of the eligibility questions that just came through is, does the, does the one fellow per institution rule apply to the VA? What a great question. I would say that it's, um, it's very hard to know across the entire VA uh, where, you know, who, who's who and where's where. So I would say within your region, within your unit, just one coming out of your unit, but then we would certainly entertain applications from different visions in the VA. Okay, thank you so much. Um, is there a minimum number of uh, publications or prior funding required? No, there's not. And really what you need to do is describe your research and your trajectory and, and your interests and where, where you've been with it and where you're going with it as part of your narrative about your work and your interests. And then your buyer sketch, you know, any other types of things that you can cite about your, about your progress and your scholarship to date would be very helpful. Okay, getting back to uh, reapplicants, a uh, question is coming up. Uh, if one does apply again after a failed attempt, do they need to specifically explain the what is new in the second application in the project and one's leadership journey that was not in the first application? No, you don't need to reference the prior application in your, in your um, new application. Just go from where you are now. We're expecting that you're probably a little bit different a year later, that you've moved along in your thinking, in your planning, and perhaps in your aspirations. So focus on, focus on that and focus on um, who you are now and what you want to become in the future. You don't need to reference the previous um, application at all. Um, and also, as far as the feedback goes, uh, we don't give specific feedback to candidates about the application. There are a number of different considerations in our selection. One is, of course, your application and uh, your strengths and your potential. The other is the, the cohort, putting together the cohort in, in, as a cohort that, that seems to be a good learning community for one another. And so that's another element to the selection. So it's, it's both individual and group level consideration as we make our offers for the fellowship program. We do post the tips and the tips and ideas for a successful application. Really look hard at that. Those are the kinds of things that are a synthesis of the areas we've seen that people have the most difficulty with when they, when they submit an application. Thank you, Heather. Uh, we're getting to the last couple of questions. And so um, 
My last question, at least, and, and depending on how the timing goes, we may have time for one more, is does a, gra does a draft of the grant have to be submitted as part of the application? Then the Qualtrics application that you'll find online <clears throat> has the specific questions with word limits. And the questions will ask you to talk about um, your, your vision, the problem statement. What is the problem you're trying to solve? They'll ask you for how you might approach solving the problem, which is akin to the methods that you might use in the, in the project. So it, it, it is in, in general, it's a, a high-level description of your project. That's what you need to submit for the purposes of this review. And then by December, we'll ask you to do a more traditional proposal where you actually articulate your aims and your methods in more detail. And that will link to both a timeline and a budget. Thank Great. you so much, Heather. I just wanted to follow up uh, with a question that was asked about mentorship. Um, and somebody had asked, can we use the funds to support the mentor's time helping the fellow throughout the fellowship? And that question was in fact answered uh, that yes, you can use uh, a portion of your funds and you would just detail that in your budget. That's correct. Thank you. And then finally, just one more question about mentoring. Uh, can a mentor be someone in the same rank, or do they have to be a higher rank? Well, it's not so much the rank, but it's their expertise and their ability to provide guidance and mentorship. Um, it, you would have to talk about how someone at your same rank is able to provide that to you, um, and that's an important element of it, because you want to make sure that they're able to actually support to, to support your growth and your development and see sort of around the corners and beyond your current horizon. But there are instances where you have somebody who's got a set of skills that you don't have, who's at the same rank, who would really be a great mentor. So make that, make that argument. But it would be looked at, I think, more critically if the person's at the same rank. So you need to definitely address that up front and talk about why that selection makes sense. I've been so excited by your questions. I, I love your engagement. Thank you so much for these wonderful questions and also for being here today with us and for your curiosity and interest. Please don't hesitate to reach out to us if you have questions as, as you digest what we've talked about today. We're going to be sending you a recording of this webinar and you'll have a chance to, to look at it and, and pick over it again and see if we answered all your questions. But don't hesitate to be in touch. We're going to have a couple of more webinars with the same content, and so let other people know, and we really look forward to seeing your applications. Thank you so much for being here today, and all the best to you.